say I've killed 40 people, not 41. If they'd have said 41, I'd have really been upset. I hate odd numbers. I admire his courage, his tenacity. He's not someone you take into your, <laughs> into your bosom. <laughs> Frankie's a legend in prison. Come on, Fraser, out that bar. Hurry up. Hurry up. I said bollocks. And he gave me a terrific punch. Bosh. I was on him. And I slung him in the bath and I tried to drown him. I like to believe the average prison officer who goes in a job is probably well-meaning, but perhaps the system brutalises them as much as it does us. Francis Davidson Fraser, you've been sentenced to corporal punishment. In your case, 18 strokes of the cat. And the prison officer could really get a swirl on it. Stroke one. <laughs> said to me, the first one really hurts you, but don't worry, after that it hurts you so much. The pain, you know, it numbs you back and you can't feel it. Your name? Francis Davidson Fraser. Your name? Geordie voice. He wanted me to say, sir, no way. And as he said it again, I just managed to get one punch in and that was it, they really done me then. And because the prison officers use brutality, intimidation, violence against the prisoners, the only way you can register any sort of protest is to respond in kind. Later on, I'm over the hospital. The doctor's put 27 stitches in me head. And he's gone to the sink to put some old-fashioned cat gut that you had in then. And while he's there, the prison officer is doing me with a wet towel right round the face. Bah! She just looked over his shoulder at the doctor. <laughs> First met Frank in a dungeon in Wandsworth Prison. He'd just been moved from, uh, I think it was Chelmsford. They just bashed him to pieces. He just arrived there. A lot of people in prison today. Six foot six, 20 stone. around a story that I allegedly pulled a guy's teeth out with pliers. I only wished it had been true, because at least when I was doing me 20 years, wouldn't it have been lovely lying in my cell and going, oh, what a good job I made of that back moment. His victims are of his own kind, really. I kidnapped him, slammed him in the car, took him to our one-armed bandits, the length of machines, and done it with an axe. I saw an axe coming, I didn't know who had it. Well, he put his hands over his head, and the axe went right through his fingers, and nailed his hands to his head. My hand was pinned to my head with a chopper. It's a lovely axe, an old boy in Harrods. I had 370 stitches. Not true, he had over 800. He went to see Reggie and Ronnie when he came come out of the hospital after four months complaining. They gave him 10 pound each and slung him out. Well, Ronnie and Reggie, I've known them since they were very small, because I knew their father first. And I can only speak highly of them. Well, out the two, I like Ronnie better, only because he was so honest. If he liked you, he told you. And if he never, he'd tell you. Before Reg died, Frank met him one last time at the Townhouse Hotel in Norwich. When Reggie was buried, he'd asked that I'd be given this envelope. And they'd give it to me at the graveside as he was buried. And this was in it with a nice letter and all. I think we're far too kind to criminals. I think we should put them away. I think a great many of them we should shoot. <laughs> we'd come out of the club about four in the morning to get a cab. No, the undercover cop appeared from nowhere. Frank and I thought he was going to fire at someone. And then he aimed the gun into Frank's face. Boom! 
and shot me here. Marilyn saved me life. When there is good baddies and there is bad goodies. And I am very aware of the uh, bad goodies because I bribe and pay policemen all my life. The public are so desperate to clean up the streets and clean up the bad guys, they don't care who kills them, really. Well, I do criticise Frank for, and I criticise myself for it, is bad judgment. We made decisions that made us spend 20 or more years in prison. And I'd hate any young man to think that what Frank or I did was clever and to follow us along that path. Uh, CCTV cameras, policemen with machine guns, helicopters, supergrasses and all that. You cannot be a gangster no more. The police have got more money to sort of <laughs> trace you now and, and catch you and it's, it's, it's all computerised now. You've got things from satellites now that can beam down and see people and take photographs. It's, it's, it's finished now, the crime. I got a message from the office uh, on my answering machine which said, Mr Francis Fraser wants to speak to you urgently. So I rang him and said, is that me, Mr Fraser? He says, yes. He says, I'm writing my autobiography and you're going to do it. And I suppose in Godfather terms, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. No, Frankie Fraser has every right to document his life, to tell his story, to seek uh, newspaper money for it. I have to go all over the country at times to talk about my life. Talk about things that have happened to me and many things that I've been punished for, more than punished. And surely no one can get alarmed with that or annoyed in any way at all. And if they are, it's just too bad. So he deserves, I think, the um, success he's had. Um, the people who knock him for it are really just sour grapes. A lot of people ask me, what are you going to say, Frank, when you meet your maker? I have to be honest and say there's no danger of that happening. I've already been booked up. I've got the chief stoker's job down below. I know where you live. <laughs>